Hello, welcome. It's time again. It's lunch with Pete. And uh, today's topic, the RF coordination process. But before we get into that, uh, good afternoon, Mac. Good afternoon, morning. Pete. Hopefully everybody's uh, had a good morning, kind of get going. And, uh, you know, for those of us in the central time zone, it's kind of a brunch with Pete. You know, it's 11 a.m., close enough. But uh, we've had a, a, a pretty... Uh, exciting week and a half so far. Um, I would say, uh, based on registration numbers, people like hearing from Pete and people like hearing about RF. Um, uh, the uh, Mac, I think our job today, uh, why don't you kind of talk people through questions? Because we're going to let Pete kind of focus, even though he'll probably do. Look, he can't resist. But uh, why don't you walk us through the, uh, the Q&A process we've been doing? Sure. Uh, there is a, in, in the... Um... Go to meeting control panel. There is a, a tab called questions. And if you hit the little uh, expand button on that, uh, you will see uh, the window to ask your questions in. Um, we, we don't actually answer the questions directly from that window. We type them into a uh, shared spreadsheet so we can see them in big type because while you're trying to present, reading that little tiny type is, is uh, at least for us old guys, pretty hard. Um, but if you put your questions in, in there, we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, I will try answering questions through that interface directly if they are not on top questions or if they are questions that I know the answer, obviously, I will, uh, I will answer it in that question window, but the others will come up and Pete will see them, Kelly and I will see them. Um, and we will answer them as we can. Um, and questions are what this is about. It's it's all it's it's driven by viewer feedback. So your questions, in in part, drive where we where we go. So I, it's important to get those questions, and we'd like to make sure you get the information you need. That's the the way to do it. Right, and, and I would say. You know, a one one thing I'd like to add to that. This is our message learned, message earned, or lesson yeah. lesson uh, learned, lessons earned, right? And Pete earned a lot of this knowledge through trial and error, right? And he worked hard at that. Um, uh, some things worked. You don't, you don't right? learn anything unless making mistakes. Right. <laughs> exactly. This is, and so if you if you if you tuned in thinking, hey. Um, Pete's going to walk me through his steps. He's going to. He's going to walk you through exactly what he did every day, step by step. I will guarantee you that when you go out and do that, not all of you will find 100% success. And that's okay, right? Because this is about applying that. Now, right now, will we have that opportunity? Probably not. You know, we're in our house. Most of us aren't going to have pretty large... <laughs> Pretty large wireless rigs, but uh, that's uh, that said, um, if Mac, if, if you've got anything you want to add, uh, should we uh, throw it to no. Pete and let him take let's it away? Get, let's get right to it. We've been using up all the time every day. Let's not waste any. There you go. All right, <laughs> it's yours, Pete. Hello. Uh, well, here, if you notice behind me, the this is my crew picture from Katy Perry's show. Ooh all the crew, I'm sort of right over here, and right behind my head is Katy Perry, but I don't wanna have all the Katy Perry fans tune in to my show just to see a picture of Katy Perry, so I'm gonna hide that picture. Uh, the What you see on the bottom of your screen there is is my website, bestaudio.com, and it um, this is this is the RF coordination page, and during during the uh, one of my tours, I'm not sure whether it was Katy Perry or, or another one. Um, I realized that I was doing exactly the same thing every single day. I was waking up in the bus at 8 a.m., going out of the bus, getting my coffee, go stand up in the uh, go find a seat up in the uh, 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 venue where I'm out of the way of all the frenetic activity on the floor loading in. And I pull up my, take my frequency frequency analyzer, and I pull up um, 
the 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 picture of um, I pull up the spectrum in the local venue I'm on, and that spectrum. Uh, for some reason, I don't have my other camera anymore. This is not good. Well, stand by one sec. Talk amongst yourself. Welcome to live webinars. Um, the uh, uh, hopefully everybody saw the link on uh, on our website to uh, Pete's download. If you don't have that, please take this moment to uh, go to practicalshowtech.com and uh, you can find on the uh, RF coordination launch with Pete a link to his booklet. Um, go ahead and grab that. You're going to be thrown off by Pete's photo though. Um, it looks like a different man. It is not. Um, he has different hair. Um, it's possible it's an alien but we're not for sure. Luckily we have some new testing capabilities so maybe that's been built in now. But the, um, the RF coordination role um, and uh, Mac, if you don't mind popping on for a second, um, I wanted to just talk briefly about um, the the importance of folks embracing this job, particularly. Um, you know, it's it's many times the most thankless job uh, around. Maybe next to the monitor engineer, um, it's uh, you're blamed for everything that didn't work, and if it does work, it was just because. That's the way it's supposed to be, right? You don't get right. thanks for it working. Um, can you, what are your what's your feeling about an A2 in any across any um, industry, broadcast, uh, uh, Broadway, corporate, house of worship? Where 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 do you think their capabilities should be? What you know is this something where it's it's somebody else's problem, or what what do you think opportunity is for the A2? Well, I think this is an opportunity for the A2, and I fortunately uh, in my career have worked with a lot of really great A2s who really get this and are actually better at this than I am. Uh, uh, they really are able to manage RF systems, both in the RF coordination and then managing them through the show. And right. uh, it, this is an important skill set for an A2. And it's also an, it's a, uh, an important skill set for people like Pete and occasionally me, uh, Henry, Jason Glass, you know, who are some of the top, really top people. I'm not one of the really top people, but <laughs> those others are. <laughs> well, but you uh, illustrate a really good point here, right? For just a second, if I could hold that thought. We're, as we move up in the show size, the scope a lot of times, um, that position then starts to 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 be spread across more people, right? So yeah. um, a lot of times in the most simplest, um, I'll, I'll do a breakout and it's me, right? Well, right. I'm the A2, I'm the RF coordinator, right. I'm the mixer, right? Yeah. And sometimes I'm the system guy, right? Um, uh, you know, when we think about day rates, it's like, hey, day rates, day rate, right? We hear that right. a lot. Um, yes, we sure do. Uh, right but then when we as we as a show scope grows we we start saying hey you know what this is a big task and One sometimes guy can't do it all anymore right exactly and and sometimes we're not doing our customer a favor when we when we say well i'll, I'll keep doing it all right, right. and we yeah. sometimes need to go okay you know what you got you got four breakout rooms going you have this you have that you want to do a reboot pete just to see uh uh, I could try that. Keep talking. I will keep talking, but uh, I interrupted you, Mac. Um, uh, you know what? What? Um... Yeah, I was, as I was saying is that exactly what you were leading into was that as the scope of the job gets bigger, the RF coordination part becomes a job that a guy has to be dedicated to. He can't also be the system tech and 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 the A2 miking people up. I mean, he's he's got a job just as an RF coordinator. And, uh, but, you know, that's at the very top with the biggest shows. For the rest of the world, somebody's gonna have to do multiple jobs and this is gonna be one of them. Right, and you know, I have this 80% rule that I've kind of adopted. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I didn't make it up. Um, 
the but the idea of if 80% of my audience can experience what I what I'm experience at the console that's a success that's a good yeah. design yes. um if 80% of my shows um uh, involve me playing a role in RF then that probably tells me I need to be I need to have the tools necessary whether that's a spectrum analyzer whether that's the software uh but that's most both. importantly, the knowledge, right? Yeah, that's a that's a prerequisite. It's like going to if you if you call yourself an RF coordinator, right? Even on the most fundamental level, if you don't have an RF analyzer, that's like going out and you're a carpenter and you're going to frame a house and not bringing a hammer. Okay? Right. Okay. It's not even a saw, right? Yeah. It's it's a hammer. It's that fundamental to the job we right. do. Now we we saw early on, you know, in Pete's you know show prep day, the levels of of uh, tools you can have. All right, you you could have a roadie, you could have um, a uh, RF explorer, either one, right? But the the idea is, how do I see this spectrum that's invisible right. to me? I wish I had a COVID analyzer where I could just wave the antenna around the 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 uh my town and go okay no covid there i'll, I'll walk right. that way right but we're yeah. looking at CBS invisible <laughs> we're, we're looking at invisible right that's what rf is and and have not having that tool so the number one rf analyzer if at the end of this week or the i shouldn't say this week at the end of this this covid challenge when work picks up again if you don't have one already Commit that when when your finances are in place and you can do it, get something. RF Explorer if you don't have one. Challenge yourself to save up and move up one level. You don't need to necessarily um, go and and spend four thousand on a used roadie or nine thousand on a brand new one. Um, There's so many great tools, but commit to yourself that I'm going to invest in my tool set. And look, Pete has just indicated to us his camera's back online, and um, we're kind of looking at a broad spectrum of investments there. So, um, Pete, uh, back to you. Uh, you want to make me a presenter again, please? I am going to. I'm going to disappear myself, and then I'm going to make you a presenter. And um, there you go. You are now a presenter. Okay. So. One of the things, as, as, as Kelly just said, there's really three aspects to uh, doing RF coordination. Uh, one is the equipment, the, the spectrum analyzer you see here, and uh, the other is um, understanding what obviously what RF is all about. Now, in the in the in the in the uh, download on my website. Uh, for the what I call Pete Burskin's RF coordination for roadies, or as it were, um, I also list a couple of references, like uh, a link to what is intermodulation interference, because it it's sort of a basic thing, and it's good to know why you're doing this doing this stuff to make all your wireless mics. I'm not going to go into the whole process uh, on this thing. Uh, the other aspect is um, a, a program to do calculations of all your inner, all your all your frequencies to make your frequencies are all working right. The one I use most of the time is uh, Intermod Intermod Analysis System uh, from Professional Wireless, and it's been around for quite a while. Uh, it is an extremely simple program uh, and allows you to easily pick your frequencies and, and account what TV stations are there etc and the thing about our wireless mic business is wireless mics operate with with the blessing of the FCC without actually any necessity for a, a license they operate in the same band as TV stations so the law says we can't interfere with TV stations. The reality is TV stations prevent our equipment from working most of the time. So we want to make sure that we're not 
not uh, in the middle of it. Uh, this, this this screen right here is um, a picture of the inner IAS program, and at the bottom of the screen you see. Let me make this general here. You see a, a picture of the scan of the spectrum in this particular city, and, and for this representation, this is the city uh, where. Uh, we were last night with the tour. We were in Henderson, Nevada. That's a very hot, very big hotspot for uh, uh, Katy Perry to go visit. And so we were there. And this diagram here, with the little bumps going up and down, those are digital TV stations. So I've marked them with yellow. And as you go along, you see a lot of different channels there. So when I do my scan, and I'll do a scan to show you how it's done. Uh, and then I go in and I mark the stations. Now, if I were to, to use this program and look up on the database, there's a TV wizard up top here. I can go there and I select the United States and uh, let me let me change what I'm looking at here. I want to look at main screen. There we go. So here I open up the TV wizard, and it asks me what where I want to get my data from: United States, Australia, or Canada. I've recently updated this software, uh, which it tells you if there is a new update, and this this data comes from the FCC. And then I change, and then I put in the zip code of Henderson, Nevada, 89002. And it pops up Henderson, and I do a search, and there's a list of all the different stations, how far they are away, what kind of power they are. And I click on import, and it imports into the system and turns this display in the upper left hand corner into the TV stations that this database says are there well the reality is things change so fast in the in the in the in this world that the fcc database being a government operated uh company um isn't quite up to date with reality so this is the scan in henderson and this was a show i did back there um uh a few months ago so you see, obviously, all these yellow places, which are the ones that the database says we have DTV stations, doesn't measure with reality. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to right click and set on all the stations that have a little bit of a bump that could be a problem. And uh, when I do that, I mark it or add it to this list of DTV stations up top. And I mark it so when the software does its search for frequencies, it avoids these areas. And these little blue lines here in the middle happen to mark, happen to relate to these frequencies that I picked for this show. So as an example, what I'm doing, I've, I've got 12 microphones, uh, sure, uh, accent digital microphones. I've got nine in-ear PSM 1000 G10s with some spares, uh, a little bit of BTR, and those are the transmits for two BTR stations, and then some belt packs for the BTR. In this program, it has the ability to do multiple different theaters that happen to be close together at the same time, and they call that zone. So here I've created my first, this all this microphones and ears and BT and the transmits for the BTR are in a zone called show. And what that means is when it does the calculation in that zone, it makes sure that it stays away from the frequency by proper spacing from any other frequencies in another zone, but it does the intermod calculations only among the frequencies are in that zone. So the thing about intermod calculations, if I do a recalculate here for this zone, so I'll 
do a recalculate the zone, it's it's done one million one hundred fifty five thousand nine hundred and sixty calculations just to figure out these frequencies right here or all of the frequencies. It's only it's done that those calculations which are quite complicated. So if I were to put these BTR receive frequencies in the same zone as this, it would end up being a lot more calculations. And it might run out of the ability to get frequencies for the harder sections to get frequencies. Now, in this particular calculation, there's a couple of different ways to do it. In options, you have the tests you can do and i i've done thirds three transmitters and fifths and the three transmitters is important to do or triple beat triple beat because that calculates the inner mod in particular that is created in amplifiers and all of these in-ears here all of these in-ear transmitters are feeding into a combiner and then coming out on one or more antennas up at the stage and once they go into that piece of electronics they're creating intermod they are mixing together electronically in a non-linear way and making intermod so that's the most important thing to do with the equipment that goes through a combiner now in reality i probably could get away with the microphones, I'm pointing to the wrong one. These are the ears up here. I probably could get away to doing inner mod on the wireless mics and only spacing my microphones uh, a minimum spacing away from all the other frequencies. Uh, when the NFL uh, does coordination for the hundreds and hundreds of press that come to a uh, football game, they don't do intermod between all of the people because they're going to be 8, 10, 12 feet, 30 feet, 100 feet away from each other and not really create any intermod just between the transmitters in the air. So they just make sure that nobody's going to step on directly anybody's frequency. Uh, so if I did this calculation with all of these on, thirds, triple beat, and fifths, and it came out with, 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 I got plenty of frequencies for what I needed. If I was desperately trying to get more frequencies, um, I would turn off, let's say I'm trying to do, get more frequencies for the uh, wireless mics, um, or let's even better example for the uh, transmitters for the BTR. Um, they would they would normally be done as triple beats as well as all of the in ears so i'm very limited to what i can get if i close this here and i try to do a scan of the dtrs uh i'm going to just do a recalculate assignment and what do i want to do i want to do control control f i'm not finding any frequencies any more than the four I had. I'm not finding any uh, that I can uh, add to this list. Um, let's see if I just do one of them. So I got that I was able to do one, one, but they happen to be, uh, uh, they could be good frequencies and, but I won't know until I examine them closely and see if there's some, maybe a DTV station right next to it, or maybe IAS often will give me a frequency that is the exact center, exact edge between two DTV stations, because it does go down, the signal goes down, and you could conceivably put maybe a microphone in there, but on an in-ear, an analog in-ear like these, you'll hear whistling and noise so it's not going to work and the worst thing you can have on a tour is your performers getting noise in their ears so i would say 90 percent of my time on a tour is 
walking every single frequency over every part of the sage with no audio in the, in the ears. So I can hear every little whisper uh, and, and gurgle that happens. Now, some monitor engineers walk them that way and get to be very critical about it. And I no disparaging comment about monitor engineers, but they hear better than dogs do, I think. Or maybe they hear better than dogs smell. I don't know how that goes. But so they're very critical about what their in-ear monitors sound like. And I learned a long time ago, there's absolutely no point in arguing about your frequency. If somebody doesn't like the frequency, just find another one until they're happy. Uh, so I will walk these all and make sure I'm happy with the sound before I hand it over to the engineers. And then while I'm picking the frequencies, I pick a few spares that I walk also because if all of a sudden during the show, one of these up here goes bad, I want to have a frequency that I know works and I can go to. So this is, a, a, for the purpose of this demonstration, let's say this is the scan in Henderson, Nevada. And our next stop, overnight bus ride, is going to be in Mount Vernon, New York. Very fast bus driver. So at 8 a.m. in the morning, I pop up, go out, get my coffee, struggle into the stand somewhere, and I get out my um, get out my spectrum analyzer, which is this little TTI, and I'm showing it to you this way because my camera has failed again, my other camera. So this is a TTI. And it's small and compact. I carry it with me in my backpack all the time um, and, and have no problem. Uh, uh, it's, it's fairly light, and I have no problem having it with me all the time. And the, um, let me go to here. And, and the, the, the use of it for me is mostly to determine if there's TV stations in the area. And here I do a basically a 60 megahertz wide scan, which means that every TV station is one box, is, is, is six megahertz, is, is one box. So each box is six megahertz. And I'm able to see in this scan of, of, of uh, Mount Vernon in this area, those little sections that are popping up. Uh, Couple of questions have come up. Um, Lucas Spangro, Spangro, Spangro asked, and and this actually came in in the last show we did with Rad, so I popped it over to my section because it had nothing to do with Rad. He asked, "How do we know what frequency the press will use?" Well, you don't, and and if you're lucky enough to do a show for the NFL where they have a very, very rigid selection program for frequencies and the press have to register in advance and give you all your, all your bands you're gonna be using and then you can give them frequencies. You're in great shape. But most shows, you don't really know what the press is using and it requires a little bit of detective work, walking around, looking for those lost ENG crews that have a giant bag of, electrosonic stuff sticking out and you grab grab them and ask them what their frequencies are and uh, I bring a, a, a my laptop with me and I plug it in and I plug in the bands they're using so let's say I had uh, some some people come to uh, this venue and um, said they were with uh, said they were with a, a press I would go and I'd go up here and I'd select a electrosonics channel where I have to know how to how the alpha of alphabet works here, electrosonics pan channel, and the person says, "Okay, I've got a block 19 transmitter I want to use," and I simplify my calculations here. I'm not looking for triple beats because they're walking around; they're far away from everybody else. This will give me more options, and then I do a calculate, and I see all the possible frequencies that will work. Now, what I want to make sure I do, let me backstep a little bit, 
in my spectrum that I did, the calculation I did for my show, I did a little bit of planning for where, where I wanted to put everything because I wanted to make sure that a, a, an in-ear monitor like PSM 1000 G10 wasn't um, right next to a, a wireless mic or even right next to a transmitter for, for uh, BTR. So when I chose these frequencies, I looked at what channel they're in. And I said, okay, I'm gonna put all my in-ears in channel 17, 18, and 21. And then when I chose my frequencies for the Axiom Digital, I looked, I saw what was available and there was a lot of available in the 17, 18, 21, but I didn't want to use those because those are the PSM 1000 that I didn't want to be near. So here's the, P, the uh, Axiom Digital, I put them in 21 through 25, put the BTRs at 28 and 30, and I put the receives way up there above everybody, uh, way away from everybody else. Uh, even though they're in a different zone, I didn't want things close like that. So go back to the screen here. So now I have to uh, I use, use this thing here and determine I want the 17, 18, 21, 25, 23. I don't want to uh, use those. So I, I see on this screen, there's some 19s I can use for him, TV 19s, and the TV 19s um i go up as far as 509975 so i'm going to make sure that i'm nine, low 19s 5021 so i'm going to cl click this low 19 and i'm going to move that that one item i'm going to select it move that one item where i have to make this zone I have to make this zone active i will have to tell it what zone i want it to be in uh, and do another reset. And here's my 19. I'm going to do a low 19, 502. I'm going to select it. And now it puts it. Uh, I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing. So my show, I want to make the active zone. And I calculate. And I see how much less is there because I've got all these frequencies in there and I'm calcu calculating only with thirds and fifths, but still I don't have much options on there. So here's my 5031, right click and move the selected item. It puts it in a little section down here. And what I usually do is I uh, say ENG and I put their phone number so I can get hold of them if I have a problem with it. And I look at that frequency on my spectrum analyzer to make it show, make sure it's okay. And then I do a check of 5031, just to make sure I'm not near any of my regular stuff. 503, it's, it's exactly in between these two ears, pretty far away, so that's good. So I collect, as I walk around, I collect uh, ENG groups. And I usually take a piece of uh, white or red uh, paper tape with me and I put a little flag over their antenna because I'm not going to remember if I ever talked to them before but I can see from a distance if they've got that little flag on um, I know I've coordinated them uh, so that's that's the main thing the um, John Safrek says where do you see the breaking line from which an event could have RF coordinator dedicated dedicated person Every show, I, as far as I'm concerned, every show. Uh, if you've got more than 10, 15 mics, you should have an RF coordinator. The main reason is the audio people, the monitor people are busy doing the creative part of the show uh, and they can't really spend any time working on it. Uh, so having a, uh, an RF coordinator is a, a, a very powerful uh inducement to get to uh, a requirement to giving the audio people the freedom to do what they want now often i do rf coordination and intercom because in reality they're sort of inter intermixed because i'm picking out frequencies for intercom devices 
But in reality, once you get all your intercom set up, once you get all your microphone set up, you have very little to do for the rest of the show. And I, uh, when I went off to do the Beijing Olympics, not as an R coordinator, but doing comms, I brought every Dan Brown book with me that was ever published. And I was finished with all of them a week before the end of the Olympics because I had so much free time. And that was a, a very, very uh, a disappointing week at the end because I couldn't find any USA English bookstores there. So we, so having an R coordinator is really, really important. Uh, and and I often producers and and tech managers see that as an advantage because having a bad wireless mic can basically destroy the show. Having a bad wireless frequency can destroy the show. Certainly having a bad in-ear frequency can destroy the show. Um, uh, the spectrum analyzers uh, on my website, um, right at the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, section, which is um, about our coordination, uh, right at the beginning of the scans section, I have a bunch of, bunch of spectrum analyzers listed here with links to their website. Keysight, FieldFox. Uh, uh, now, now, obviously, I, I have to log in. That's not fair. I love that you collect your own information so you can remember who you are. Um, uh, often, I can't. So I ha I've written them all my passwords on my palm. Well, that works out okay. Although I guess every time you shower, it's kind of like getting a new new booklet. So uh, I can't get every couple of weeks. Are you sure you're using that? the right email? Isn't it not Peter? You know, you are so sharp. Like I said, this is how you keep track of who you are. So it works out okay. So back to scans, right at the beginning of that page. And that login, I, I make everybody who's using the scans page and the downloads page and whatnot, create a login. Uh, there's no charge for using any of these pages. Uh, it just helps keep the, uh, the riffraff out, as it were. Um, so here's the, the spectrum analyzers pointing to TTI PSA series, which is the one I used that showed you the Roden Schwartz FHHC, which is the one I used to own before. Uh, RF Explorer is a fairly inexpensive one, about $300. Uh, and it also works with uh, RF, the RF venue software, which is really great. There's also a list of RF of classes available for RF coordination uh, from all these companies. And the all the different RF coordination software that you can use. Uh, a brand new one, which I haven't listed on here, is uh, RF coordination software at the Audio Technica site. It is a uh, similar looking uh, to to uh, similar acting to Wireless Workbench, but has a lot of extra features that are particularly interesting and i'm not going to cover that here today but i would probably later on i will be covering that now this page is a page of scans that i've had people collect and i'll be doing a whole whole show on this these are scans from around the world and this is the database of all the places where they're at and this is a map of where all the scans have been done from around the world so this is a terrific tool to uh, 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 to help you get back and forth to uh, to to pre coordinate your your uh, wireless before you get to a city. You can look at a scan that somebody else has done. Um, Roden Schwartz uh, K 
can save the 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 scan in a CSV. I never use that because it's such a big device to carry. Uh, same with my field fox can save it. The the uh, the TTI is really small. It's got a USB plug connection that allows me to plug my my uh, stick in there and export it. So uh, that's my what what I think. Uh, they're on that same page in the website about doing scans there are links to people who have used rodent schwartz who have used field fox who have used explorer and how they use it and how they get csv files out of it and at the bottom of the page are about four or six excel macros that i use to massage these things once once i put them into my equipment uh, ias stable um, I, I've never had a problem with IAS uh, that wasn't traced to bad Windows program, bad win Windows operating system. Uh, now I have my Mac runs parallels with Windows 7, which I know is not supported anymore, but it's stable. It does what I need it to do for the three or four programs I need to run under Windows, and it works great. So. You should probably talk to the people at PWS and see if they can have a can explain why your IAS is is downloading. Um, John also asked, can the TV Wizard be used in Europe? It works in Europe, uh, United States, and Australia are the databases that it can look up. Um, RF Explorer looks like it's not very accurate because when you look at the uh look at the um screen on it it's very low resolution you barely can see that you have a frequency on the screen but if you plug it into your computer it's as high resolution as any spectrum analyzer around there and it, it works really really great once you plug it into the software in the computer um uh Cassie Manning says, regarding combiners and IMD, aren't the combined signals less prone to noticeable IMD because the port-to-port -port isolation of the combiner input is in the magnitude of 50 dB instead of antenna-farm transmitters, which certainly produces noticeable IMD in the air? Well, transmitters put right next to each other, piled on a table, sitting right next to each other. If you look at the spectrum, you'll see tons of interference. But as soon as you place them three or four feet apart, all that goes away. So the intermod created in the air is not really the problem. The intermod created in your combiner. Um, and all of the combiners that are, that are, that are, that are out there that are successful, the, 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 one from RAD and the, the bunch of them from Shure and Sennheiser, all have sufficient isolation between the inputs to minimize uh, intermod uh, creation. So I don't quite understand your question, but because I, they're not really uh, prone to uh, intermod as long as you're using the proper equipment. Now. I occasionally have used external uh, RF isolators when I've been in a particularly noisy area, like right next to a TV transmitter or something like that. And I want to keep that from getting into my equipment. And I put that RF isolator uh, right on my antenna to really sort of filter out anything coming uh, not on the antenna, but uh, uh, right on the transmitter output, so I can filter out anything getting into the combiner. Um, Nate Corin, uh, big fan of videos, best audio, all wondered what are triple beats? Well, triple beats are intermod caused by three frequencies at the same time. So when you have intermod with two frequencies, if you have these are the two frequencies, you have the sum of these two frequencies and this and the difference of these two frequencies show up 
as intermod on either side. Uh, and then you have another version that's the third order intermod, then you have fifth order intermod, um, and it goes out to maybe seventh if you've got a really se uh, sensitive uh, spectrum analyzer to see. But a, but a triple bead is doing the sum and difference of these, the sum and difference of these, the sum and difference of these, which it makes a lot more, more intermod, and that's more of the reality when it goes into a combiner. You have a lot of different frequencies in there. So that's a much more complicated calculation. Uh, you'll, unless people are standing with their wireless microphones right next to each other, you'll never create triple B intermod on wireless mics, but people, wireless mics are always sufficiently far apart and their transmitters are not going through a combiner, which is what the real source of the intermod is. That article I mentioned in the white paper, what is intermod? talks extensively about what third order is. Um, have you ever had to say, no, we don't have a frequency for you? Or actually what I say is, yes, we don't have a frequency for you. Um, no, I've never said that because, because worst case, if somebody, let's say one of these ENG crews comes up to me and, um, wants to get a frequency and I try to do a frequency that works with my inner mod on the system and uh, I can't get it, I can't fit it in there. But I turn off all the inner mod. Let me go back uh, back here and turn off all of these, turn off thirds. I shall try it once with fifth, everything. Now turn everything off. Now when I calculate it, it's just going to find me a frequency that's separated from any other frequency by 0.299 uh, uh, and and then I know I found a hole for them to go in, so I give them give them a frequency. I've done. I did a show for the Chinese National Orchestra in, for Claire Brothers in in, uh, in in the Kennedy Center, and they brought or they required the vendor to supply them with eighty wireless microphones for an orchestra. And the uh, half of the wireless microphones were handhelds. Uh, about a quarter of them were headset mics on lav packs, and the remaining ones were uh, sure, sure um, butt plugs for their phantom-powered mics they traveled with, and they put but those on. Say that again. Plug-on transmitters, correct. Plug-on transmitter is a more appropriate way to say that. But the um, the reason they needed it is they, they had a, they're an orchestra, but they had a lot of movement of their orchestra. They were tables moving in and out. There were elevators going up and down. So we had 80 wireless microphones in the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., which is, which is a fairly crowded RF location being indoors in the kennedy center made a difference we had a little bit of shielding but we had absolutely no problem in finding 80 wireless mic frequencies um in a show that i did with henry cohen a few weeks ago and matt care in in las vegas there were a lot of breakout rooms in this convention center and henry coordinated almost 600 wireless mic frequencies for that event and had no real problem in, in finding enough frequencies for everybody. It's just a matter of massaging it and, and, and looking around and, see, and, and looking at the spectrum inside each room to see if maybe there's something you uh, missed. Uh, a church I did uh, uh, 200 frequencies for that was the same sort of thing, had a tons of breakout rooms. They had sure uh, Axion Digital for their main theater, and they had ULXD uh, sure for all of the breakout rooms. And both the Axion Digital and the sure ULXD have a mode called high density mode, 
which is where you turn the power, it turns the power down really low on the transmitter, like one milliwatt, and you can stack the frequencies right next to each other, 400 kilohertz apart, filling up the entire thing, no intermod needed. And uh, I was able to put uh, most of the wireless mics, this was in Chicago, which is uh, very uh, hot, intense with uh, TV stations. I was able to put all of the ULXD rooms on low density mode because they were all rooms no, no bigger than a small classroom. So one milliwatt transmitter is having no problem transmitting there. And then we kept uh, put all of the ULXDs on a weak DTD stations because they're digital and they, as long as they're 10 dB hotter than the, the signal you're putting them on, they work fine. And I left for the church to use at their discretion three totally empty channels which i knew the wireless were going to work on if they ever had a problem with the frequency they could move them to that frequency so uh no i don't usually say uh no to frequency now on the other hand if we've already done the we've already done the tech and we've already done the dress rehearsal for a show and the TD comes up and says, all of a sudden, I need to have another wireless mic for this, uh, this musician. I'm very resistant to making any change that can't be rehearsed and checked in advance of the real show. So I generally, if somebody asks me after the dress rehearsal, if a change can be made, I usually say no to that. Um, That's, uh, you know, one question I have for you, Pete, that you've, it's a question and kind of a statement and you answered some of it with this church scenario you just ran but it sounds like power management you know you've got you've got IAS you've got your scans but um, a lot of times uh, it sounds like by by managing our output power uh, what's your general rule of thumb then on uh, you know do you just say okay if it can tune it 100 milliwatts or if it can tune it 50 milliwatts or if it can tune it quarter you know, uh, 250 milliwatts. Do you just automatically weapons that stun? You know, full power, or what's your what's yeah, your I philosophy mean, there? Exactly the opposite. I start with all my transmitters at their minimum minimum power, uh, because in a, in a in a theater, a stage 150 foot wide, you don't need anything more than even 10 milliwatts to get your wireless mics to work right, as long as they're on a clean spectrum, as long as they're where there's absolutely no interference. Uh, first indication of is if you have bad wireless mic distance, you walk your wireless mic away from the antenna and all of a sudden it drops out, look at the spectrum. Dollars to donuts, there's a some other frequency on there that's getting in your way or maybe just high noise. Um, first two Tim McGraw and Faith Hill tours I did years ago, they had a video floor, the whole floor was video, and the whole floor made 10 dB hotter noise floor across the entire stage. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to get, particularly the in-ears to work. And the way we did is we hung antennas over the stage so that when the performers were on the stage, the antennas were five feet from their head. And we, uh, and we were able, as long as that, so the, the transmitter antennas for the in-ears literally were closer to their transmitters, which were in the small of their back, than the floor. So we were able to get better to signal noise for that. But even with that, it took me literally until showtime every day to walk frequencies, find another one, find another one, find another one, until I found frequencies that would work. So, okay. And I was right, not, well. I was not pumping up a lot of power in that system. I didn't need the power. I needed needed to have the the, the signal to noise to be better. That darn inverse square law again, right? Um, well, I, all right. I, I'm hoping that they eventually repeal that because it would help a lot. <laughs> well, I'll let you get back to your list. I just wanted to ask about that power management because it's not just software alone, right? So right, right. All right, back to your list. Trying to um, yeah, I'm going to end up with with more questions and I, I'll never get to the entire process here. How about but, RF isolators? <laughs> exactly, but but I think that the important thing to say is um, 
there is in this in this 30 page book um, there's a couple of lists of how to do your coordination to get it to get it going and the first list list you scan the venue for the tv stations in use and typically what i do is let me find my thing here let me see if i can do this so you can see me here so here i have a setup i'm going to go into a call setup and i i've set my 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 uh setups so that they come in a couple of different flavors right at the top it says 20 times 44 that is a gain of 20 db at channel 44 and if you go down to the bottom of the list there's 40 at 44 so i've adjusted the reference gain for each one of these so when i'm in an area that has uh uh I'm right down by the transmitter. I don't need much gain on my spectrum analyzer to see the picture, but if I'm out in the boondocks and they're, they're very weak, then I'll go up to a, a 40 channel. So here we're gonna, the 40 times channel 34 recall. And in a second, it does eight average scans and I have the picture. So now I have the picture of what I want. I then go trace, store, Save as, change name, and I give it the name, 44. So I've saved that scan. Uh, once I have all those scans saved, I stick them in a folder and uh, start IAS to work. So here I am in this, this, uh, this show that came from Henderson, Nevada, and I'm going to import um, uh, am I showing that now? Yes, I'm going to import sweep data, RF sweep data from my New York scan at Metropolitan Studios. And when I open up the folder, I see in the folder, there's my channel two, channel seven, channel 14, 24, 34, 44, and 900 scans. I don't have to put them all in one scan. I just put these 60 megahertz scans in a pile here and I open them up, it then asks me, oh, I have to select them, small detail. Select all of them and go to open, and IAS brings up this screen here and wants to know the name of my scan, longitude and latitude, the date of it, et cetera. And if I fill this stuff in, this information is entered in the IAS database in their system. So when I, if I put that in there, when somebody else comes and looks for a scan in this area, it will offer this as a scan from their database. So you don't have to do your scan. I'm saying, okay. And here I'm gonna go back to here, go to general to get rid of those things here. Now, I go to calculate frequencies, close candidate list. I have to go back and delete the old scan first. So here's my new scan from uh metropolitan studios in manhattan you, the yellow are the channels that work for henderson nevada now if i wanted to change this label up here i would then use the the tv wizard like i did before but i put in a zip code in new york that's near near where this theater is and search and import it says i'm going to invalidate my coordination because i'm changing all this and it imports the tv stations that it thinks uh, are in new york now it didn't change the henderson name it should have changed that let me look at that again next 
model two five, search, import, okay. There we go. Now TV stations in New York. And if I double click on this, I get a display of the stations, both the former analog and the current DTV that I can manually turn the channels on and off. Uh, but what I choose to do is go down to the uh, display on the bottom and manually decide my, for myself what the reality is. Now, like I said before, the reality is gonna be different than you download from the FCC and it shows it is totally different. So this is a DTV station, whereas this is not. This is not. This is not. Now this scan at Metropolitan was done outdoors, outside, on the street. Um, this, is a, this is DTV, obviously. It is a DTV. So here's another DTV down here. Uh, the first three channels, 14, 15, 16, are used by a lot of different uh, public service frequencies. So I always exclude them unless I'm desperate. If I were using a BTR E88, which is down here, and I needed to get some frequencies, I would try to pick a frequency that was clear of everything, but these frequencies often are mobile frequencies, so I would be playing with fire to, uh, to go down there. So here we're gonna clear a bunch of these, we're gonna clear a bunch of these. See, this is high noise floor, Probably not DTV, but it seems awfully high noise floor. This I'm gonna make a DTV. So this may be caused by the, the, the noise, by the settings in the TTI. Now, I don't really have to worry about everything above channel 37, which is this pink one here. So this is all the, the, uh, the new channels that um, are used by uh, uh, primarily this one right here, T-Mobile, and I'm never gonna put any frequencies up there. I had frequencies up there uh, in, in this last show, so it shows here. So I've entered my new frequencies. Now I wanna go and recalculate from my local show. I'm gonna start my recalculations with the transmitter, with the transmit channel. So I'm gonna turn on all modes, third, triple beat, and fifths, and I don't need to test color carriers because there are no color carriers in this. I'm going to go 40 megahertz away uh, for inner mods, which will give me a better chance of finding things. And I'm going to say OK here. So I'm going to go to the ears section here first. And I'm going to do a control F, which will find me all the channels it can find. Well, see, this, this mode is not gonna work very well. So to do this, I would have to, um, if, if I just did a normal recalculate, like recalculate assignment like that, it's gonna recalculate these. And it's gonna tell me that the yellow, red one, yellow ones, it found a new frequency. And the red ones, it could not find a new frequency. So I'm, I'm short of frequencies for these ears. And they're all down in the G10 band, which is down on the bottom of the screen. So, uh, which is this section right in here. If I look, look at sure, sure, DSM 1000 G10, on the frequency display, it shows me the band that I can use with this. So here's G10 that works up in this thing. So I have only this segment to work in. So we jammed most of them in this section right here, which is, is, is a D, D, DTV station. So why didn't it use more channels down here? Because it did have this open segment. question is, I don't know. Um, let me try doing a recalculate again.
So this is a question I often often struggle with. Uh, whereas originally the, the, the G10s were able to find one right after the other in this area, and 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 this is also a G10 and it's barely used. So I may have to start this coordination by eliminating the other thing, other frequencies on my list here, like this. So now I've minimized what I'm looking for here to only the ears. And I'm going to right click and do a control F, which will find me a list. So here's, here's a list of all the frequencies that it can do in addition to what's here. So I found a few more. So if I just do an ear, ear recalculate for the whole assignment, I found frequencies for all of them. I'm going to do an undo. And I'm going to redo that again. I'm going to undo even further. Now the undo, it, it, just like any undo, it undoes everything you did as you went along. So if you do an undo, you're going to undo everything you step through. And here's my ears, and I'm going to do a recalculate assignment on those. And there, there, since I started with the settings that I had in Henderson, it only changed the yellow ones. So in this case, coming from a relatively empty place of TV into the New York City area, or it, it became much harder to get frequencies for my in-ears. And these in-ears ended up being in uh, channel, these, these channels right here. So you see this one that says 17D and 19D? Those channels are adjacent, directly adjacent to a DTV station. Um, let me see if I look up that frequency here on my spectrum analyzer. Uh, well, where I am located here, it is not uh, a, a bad frequency, but you actually want to look at every different frequencies on this. Now you can do that with the with the with the with the uh, TTI. If I go, I have set up, recall set up, and one of them I have in here is a frequency. If I go down here, just 40x frequency which means I have high gain and I'm just looking for frequencies like that. And I say recall. And I now I'm doing, a, 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 a on my screen, I'm doing only one megahertz wide on the screen. So I'm looking close, looking at the frequency. And I put in that frequency, uh, well, let's say, let's put in, 505, 575. So frequency, center, set center, 505.575. Okay, and exit. Now, now that is a really clean spectrum. I have no problem with putting a wireless mic in that spectrum. I, my, basically, my, my noise floor is minus 120. So that's what you really want to look for when you're when you're trying to find a, a, a clean place to put a mic somewhere where it's really low. Now, if this if this were a frequency and I had saw a little bit over here and a little bit over here, as long as I was two squares away from that center frequency, which is 200 kilohertz on either side, um, I'd be uh, happy with that frequency. So I'd have to, what I'd have to do is work through this spectrum and pick all the new frequencies for all the new mics uh, uh, one, uh, the old way. Now, so for instance, I'd have to sure Axiom Digital G57 band 
I now do a calculate range. I'm going to turn on options, turn off the triple beat. And I'm going to do a here range and calculate. Now it's going to find all of the G57s, which work. Now the G57 range, if you look down at the bottom here, covers the entire spectrum all the way up to 600 megahertz. So it, it, it the calculations sometimes take a few seconds to do in this, but but now I can have I can pick a bunch of frequencies up here in channel 31 which I know is away from all my ears. And I can just select all the ones I need and right click and move selected items. And here's my new mics. Now, normally I would pick all of the transmits to start with, but I didn't do that here. So I'm gonna go now look at that BTR, LX, BTR 800. C transmit, and I'm going to turn on my triple B because they're going through a combiner. And I'm going to do a calculate, and it's not going to find very many. So that's all I found. And here, they, these are luckily in between all those. So I'm going to pick all of these. So I have a spare. And now if I look at the spectrum that I'm using up here, I have the PSM 1000s on the bottom. Then, then in the middle, I have the, the BTRs and at the top, I have the microphone. So what I would do is then I would take this list, I would go through each frequency and look at them in detail, close up with my uh, field fox, which is a much, it has a keypad and much easier to use. And then I, by then, by, by about then, I'm hungry. So I go to catering and I get my, my, my breakfast. It's probably about um, 9, 10 a.m. Then the audio truck is dumping and my racks of RF equipment come off the audio truck and I steer them to some back hallway near a, an outlet. And I plug them in in the back hallway and I freak them all up the way they want to be. And um, then I still can't get to the stage. Stage hasn't pushed yet. So I usually end up going to lunch. And then I, the stage ends up being ready. All the, all the, all the, uh, the, the platforms under the stage are all ready. Monitors have moved in, all that sort of stuff. And I'll push the, push the transmitter racks back out to the monitor, push them up on the stage, wire them all in. And a lot of the stage I have pre-designed, so I have antenna routes built into the stage with little um, Velcro straps around there. So I will be able to run my antenna out and strap it all in, put my antennas out. And then about uh, noon, the stage is ready to be pushed underneath the, uh, the, the lighting grid and they push it under the lighting grid. They finish their sets, uh, setups. And uh, we're basically all set up by two o'clock. So if the band wants to do a uh, rehearsal, and rare, rarely did they ever do a rehearsal, occasionally they want to insert a new song into the show, so they'll go out and do a rehearsal. Other than that, we if, if everything was working with the wireless, um, and this is when I would do my walks of the stage to make sure all the in-ears would work on the stage before I told uh, Johnny B, okay, they're ready. Go, you go listen to them, and then he would go out and listen to them, and he'd be very happy with them. Because I, if I, I, I learned how to be critical enough, so uh, once we get out on the stage, um, uh, we're happy with it. Uh, so let me see if I can tackle a couple more questions here. Um, Do you feel there is any benefit, benefit or detriment to separating combiner freaks with zones? Um, no, I wouldn't separate them with zone. If we're doing, if the combiners of my in-ears and my BTR and stuff like that were in the same RF space, I'd want them to be in the same zone. So they all got calculated um, 
uh, intermod amongst all of them. If if I was doing a show, uh, this is from Nathan McBee. Hello. Um, if I was doing a show where there were two different stages, let's say on either side of a fairground, uh, where the stages were a hundred feet apart, say. I wouldn't bother including them in the intermod because I'm far enough away from their system to not have much of a problem. As long as I was spaced, I would be okay. Um, where I do use of other zones, which I explained earlier on this, is in order to get more frequencies from the intermod program that work together, I will move out of that zone things like the btr belt pack transmit because the belt packs are only transmitting when they're pushing the button they're not uh they're not always on transmit and if i move them into their own zone uh, i'm in a little bit better uh position however by doing that it's highly likely that some of those btr belt pack received channels uh, and transmit channels will end up on an intermod from my main zone. And so what I'll find what you find out when you do this and you throw your your transmits for the BTRs out in nether nether zone out of the main zone, if you're on another intermod, it won't work too well. And it, the only solution is test them, find another one until you find the ones that all work. Uh, strangely enough, I always had problems with um, wireless mics on bass guitar, and I guess it's because it's it's a much more powerful audio signal. The, the bass guitar seems to be always the one that leaks into uh, the BTRs. Um, so let me clear this up here. Another frequency, how many scans do you take per day? Just one in the morning. Um, I don't do scans to look for all those little frequencies that might be showing up on your, on your spectrum analyzer. The important thing for the scan is to determine what the TV spectrum is like in that space. So it's, I've never had a show where the TV spectrum has changed in the middle of the day. I'm sure it, it has happened to people, but I, I've never been there. Um, the, um, Todd Wines, the, uh, the, the link to Intermod, uh, uh, explaining Intermod on the website is a good place to find out about third, fifths, and triple beats. Um, how do you set up your TTI if you want to import a scan into WWB? Well, WWB is a little bit different. Um, uh, scan imports um, can also be CSV files. Um, so here is a, here's a wireless workbench. And if I go into frequency coordination, on the left-hand side here, scan files, I open up the little box here, this, the, the folder, and access files. Actually, I wanted to access files in my Dropbox. And I'm gonna go to the practical show Dropbox to lunch with Pete. And here's the same scan file we just loaded in here, which is the outside uh, Metropolitan Studio scan. And I select all of them. Well, for some reason, I can't select all of them, but maybe it just takes them all open. Well, that's interesting. I can't import it. Oh, you know what? I forgot to mention this. There's, there's a, 
a lot of um, data in files, like the files from TTI, the files from uh, FieldFox, they're not all compatible CSV files. So uh, this, 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 this data here from TTI has all this information, like what model it was scanned on, all this kind of stuff in there. And you need to, to extract that stuff before you can actually import it into Workbench. Um, we're going to have a whole Workbench presentation coming up for sure, and we'll talk about that at that point. So I'm not going to cover it here. Um, IAS is uh, to do inclusion and exclusion files is a little different with uh, IAS. Um, there isn't a way to actually in include things. Let's say I had uh, the the mics on the uh, on this particular show, and I wanted to force them to be in a particular place. So I'm going to um, uh, go back to the sure thing here, to the AD to that, and I'm going to eliminate the mics, move the assignment. And so here's our here's our spectrum here that the mics will work in. But let's say I knew that I wanted to use this whole spectrum down here on the bottom uh, and this spectrum here and this spectrum here for other things. So I'm going to just artificially turn these on to DTV, DTV, which is going to eliminate them from the scan when it tries to find something to go in there. Now I've just got two channels open and I'm going to do a calculate for sure. And it's only found frequencies in this hole here. It did find a bunch of frequencies that are on the border between BTV, which are these here. But the frequencies that it fit right into this thing right here are only these channels right here. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So I'm going to just move those. And there's my frequencies. I'm going to clear the rest of this stuff out. So here's the frequencies that fit into this hole right here. So then if I wanted to uh, do uh, the Shure PSM 1000s, they're in the G10. So they're, they're already down in this area. They don't affect these two because they don't cover that far. It keeps unzooming, stop that, stop that. So these, I would just open these up to the ability to have frequencies in them. And uh, let's say I wanted to open this one up here too, because even though that's in the in, in, in a, a low zone. Uh, and then I do a, if I took out the, um, uh, the ears here, took out the ears, and then did a scan for new ear frequencies, here it found all those in there. It did find a couple on the on the border between do TV, DTVs like these, but all the rest of these were in channel 21, 22, and 17, which are all down here. So I've in, so I've forced the calculation into a different place. Now this does seem like a lot of uh, right clicking and 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 that sort of stuff, but it's it actually takes less time than it takes about the same amount of time as creating inclusion and exclusion zones in Workbench, which you have to basically create a zone, name it, tell it what channels are part of it. And for repeated calculations, it's a good place to go. Um, any particular method or preference for ideal frequency spacing to accommodate for IEM transmit intermods amplified by an active TX combiner. Well, the spacing is based on what space you need for each carrier. So approximately the way IAS defaults to spacing is it puts them 300 kilohertz of bandwidth for each thing. If I had, um, sometimes on, on tour, I made the in-ear monitors 400 kilohertz apart, uh, 
just to give them a little bit more protection, particularly if I found that I'm getting getting a, a crosstalk from in ears that tend to get. If your monitor engineer is not careful with the levels and they ended up overloading the transmitters, where they basically turn red and say error, 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 um, you're you're overloading the transmitter and causing it to splatter all over the spectrum. And so if you 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 have a monitor engine that tends to do that, spacing them a little bit further apart uh, might be a, a solution. Although getting them sneaking into the to the transmitter and turning down the gain on the transmitter sometimes helps too although then he'll just start overdriving his console um, uh, Brad Galvin wants to know do I typically pick a frequency from the list or do I just look at where it lies within my coordination and against your scan file prior to using the frequency well First of all, the scan file, if it's, I've entered down the bottom here, the frequencies that are being picked are avoiding the channels that have TV stations on them. Um, and sometimes I will pick, if I have a lot of spectrum and I don't worry about it, like I'm doing the mics or the ears, I'll pick every other frequency to leave a lot of space. But IAS doesn't really require it. It works fine if I pick them all right next to, you know, in the list, adjacent, adjacent things in the list because they're properly intermod space. Uh, LED walls, as I told you before on, on Tim McGraw and Faith Hill, were a, a severe problem. And I told you we put the uh, ear transmitters hanging, antennas hanging right above their heads. But one song, they insisted on sitting on the floor to sing that song. And their, their in-ears didn't work, and I just had to tell them, take them out of your ear. You're not going to have in-ears when you're sitting on the floor. That's the way it is. And they, it, to them, it was more important to sit on the floor than to have their ears work, so they, they lived with it. Um, Jan Safrick says, does it make a sense to have such a scan database since the condition on each place is changing? Yes, it does. Because if you look in the, it, it, let me change over to this screen here. So here's the map of, of, of the world here. And I'm gonna scan in a little bit. So here in the US, the green ones, are scans done in the last six months. The yellow ones are scans done in the last half of this year, and the red ones are over a year old. So yes, the spectrum is changing, but they're at least a little bit correct. You know, they, the spectrum doesn't change that much, particularly, well, right now, the spectrum is changing a lot. So I would try to stay with the green ones. So one of the things, with this scan database is, if you don't have a scan directly where you wanna be, you can zoom in. And here I in Des Moines, if I'm doing a show out here, I can take this scan and be fairly sure that it'll be, that it'll be representative of the TV out there. And this is a scan that was done in the last month ago. I can click on the scan. I can see it was done in Des Moines uh, at the Iowa State fair outside so that's good uh i can uh, see who did the scan john sulik is a great scanner so i would be have a lot of confidence in it confidence in that and i could even click on this link right here and go to the map uh the google map of where this venue is and i could go zoom in and see exactly what this thing is there there's the iowa state fairgrounds where this obviously that's before they constructed it, Google is not that current in, 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 in their maps. But so the database does make sense in terms of uh, uh, in terms of having some reference of some place that you might be able to get to. 
you know, to give you some inf inf information. And this is particularly inf important if you're going to another country, if you're going to Australia or New Zealand or, or Japan or Tokyo, um, which basically all have the same TV stations, same area TV stations, if the, you can do some research and there are FCC-like databases in most countries, but it's, it's, not, it's a little hard to find them. And sometimes they're not any more, they're certainly not as accurate as somebody who's just done a scan in that area. So looking at the scan from another country gives you an idea. Um, even so, uh, in the Czech Republic, they're in the middle of a transition phase to DTV. And those channels may change every day. So the important thing is to do a scan by yourself when you get on site, to do your own scan uh, before you uh, um, uh, can start with your coordination. Uh, that's the important thing. And, and doing a scan in the database might give you a start of, give you ability to select what equipment you want to bring on the tour. Um, early on in, in, in all the tours I've done, I've done a rough coordination for every single city I was going to go to. And some of them I found that I didn't have the right equipment to cover it. So I told the rental house months in advance when we were going to a particular city, uh, for this particular, this particular one happened in, in Italy, that I couldn't make the, the BTRs or, or the, the, uh, the in-ears work in that city because of the way their DTV was. And I also knew that Italy is, is, is uh, RF spectrum is a, is a wild west operation. It never follows any r rule. So everybody just starts a station whenever they want to. Um, so I made arrangements and they arranged for a local rental house in Italy to bring me uh, equipment that would work there. So doing your coordination for your entire tour, just to get an idea uh, uh, of what it is, is a great thing to do. Um, how do you manage the frequency deviation due to a cheap analyzer, RF Explorer, on a large span? First of all, RF Explorer, if you plug it into a computer and use the software, you get as detailed and accurate a scan as you would on any cost spectrum analyzer. This field fox I have, um, it, it, I, I'm going to try to bring it over so I can show it to you because my other camera is not working. This field fox uh, is a terrific device. It has a lot of features that I like to use uh, uh, in the field, particularly as a keypad. So I could punch in the frequencies and look at it. The main reason I bought it was I can read it in direct sunlight. This the screen is bright enough and has has um, uh, actual uh, uh, options for changing the way the screen looks to look better in sunlight. Uh, my prior spectrum analyzer was a a uh, Roden Schwartz FX H3 and the screen got dimmer, 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 dimmer. And finally, I, I, there was no way I could read it in the sunlight. And it was just was not useful. So I sold that off to some, somebody who knew. I, I was fair. I was up front with them. Don't bother reading it in, in uh, uh, sunlight. And he said, that's OK. I'm going to be indoors all the time. And he was perfectly happy to buy it. Now, you can find the Field Fox and the Roden Schwartz on eBay for a few thousand. Uh, I will uh, caution you in doing that. Uh, a friend of mine bought a field fox like this for a few thousand on eBay, and uh, it had the old version CPU in it. And uh, then it stopped working, and he went to the factory to get it fixed and or upgraded. And it was going to cost as much as he spent on it originally to get it fixed or upgraded. And so he just, it would. It's not not worth it. If you are a professional spectrum uh, coordinator, 
uh, look at look at spending at least at least the the two thousand dollars for this and the twelve to eighteen thousand dollars for the field fox because they're tools of your trade you need them to do the job properly um, where am i in this here rf isolator um an rf isolator is an interesting little device and uh henry cohen is the one to ask about the details about this but it but it's basically a box that you have rf going in and there's a magnet inside and the rf coming in one this side gets deflected by the magnet toward an output that has you put a termination on so the termination is sucking up all the rf coming in here but the magnet is is not reflecting the same way the rf that's coming in in this direction so it comes goes straight out so the rf coming from your antenna is directed toward uh, the, the 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 output and the rf coming uh, going to your uh, coming from your transmitter goes straight out the output um, I don't know why IAS uses 0.99 separation. Um, it, it, you know, it. The, you know, you're right. They're so close. What difference does it make? So IAS uses like 0.299, and uh, the wireless workbench uses 3.00 separation. Don't know. Um, uh, could you please explain what intermodulation spacing factor is? I have the faintest idea. I'd have to go look it up. I'm not like a super RF engineer the way uh, uh, many other coordinators are. Uh, and what I usually do is I call Henry Cohen and he explains it. Um, is the reason that the ENG transmitter can find a frequency, is it that in your monitor and ENG aren't occupying the same space. Well, they are working in the same spectrum. But when I found, when I looked for a, 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 a frequency using IAS, I just turned off everything and I did a, I did a search for the electrosonic band in a block and i did a calculate and all of these frequencies it found out are appropriately spaced from all of these frequencies they're all at least 0.399 or 299 away from them so they're spaced uh, safely um they're usually an eng audio person their rule of thumb, the way they should be operating, is they come into a theater and they should turn on their receiver and see if their frequency is clear. If it's clear, they're safe reasonably to turn on their transmitter. In reality, other transmitters, like on my show, could be off. And as soon as I turn mine on, he's blown away. So it's better if you are doing any rf on any theater in any location find out in advance if there is going to be a, a frequency coordinator on site and contact them in advance because they're not there to police you they're there to protect you so they're going to pick a frequency for you and protect everybody else from that frequency so you have exclusive use of it how far, how far can one milliwatt travel through the air? Well, I would say a couple of hundred feet if you're lucky, if you have a really, really, really quiet, low noise spectrum. Uh, the, the high density mode of ULXD and Axiant Digital that run at one or two milliwatts do fine in a small room. I'm not worried about them in a small room. I wouldn't push my luck and get them to cover an entire stage. Um, Gerald said, said, uh, pardon the phrase, 
body pack attenuation question. I'm a corporate tech. I'd love to do my transmitters on 10 mil or one or but many a time you get a CEO sitting on a couch, crushing their belt pack, and you'll get the presenter grabbing the handheld at the transmitter. Uh, first of all, when you test your wireless bell pack and your handheld mic, test it in the worst case. Have your A2 hold it by the antenna and see what the level is on your receiver. See if you're getting decent level on the receiver. Uh, if you've got a large stage, 150 feet apart, you may want to bump up that handheld mic to a higher power uh, if it is, is weak. Now by weak, if it isn't locked really hard on the RF display, if I like to have a hard lock, strong signal from my mic, even when the transmitter it cover uh, transmitter antenna is covered up. Some mics, like uh, Sennheiser mics, have their antenna is such an odd shape on the bottom. Presenters don't tend to grab it by the bottom, whereas sure antennas have a nice, round, comfortable uh, bump on the bottom, and they're often grabbed that way. Uh, can't hurt to tell the uh, tell the presenter to hold it a certain way. Just warn them up front. I uh, did a show a few weeks ago where we had a panel of people sitting at the stage. And I had my receive antennas 15 feet behind them, behind a curtain, really close. And we had the moderator of the panel. All of a sudden, he gets out there, he's standing up, he's presenting, and then he sits down in the chair, and his RF goes down to half. And I figure, okay, something's broken out there. The antenna on the transmitter is broken, whatever. And we still, we we sort of, when we had a break, we changed the transmitters. It still has still the same thing. He's always low. And then one of the A2s noted that the chairs they were sitting in were all metal and all metal box. And this person didn't want to wear the wireless transmitter on his hip to the side. He insisted on it being the small of his back. So he was basically covering his antenna up with tinfoil. We could have given him tinfoil and saved a lot of uh, a lot of problem and it stopped him from talking anyway. Uh, antenna analyzer to examine your RX antennas. Um, this spectrum analyzer, the field fox, has a mode called uh, CAT, which, um, let me see if I can bring it up here. Here we are. This is a mode called return loss. So I bring it into that mode, and on this, on this mode here, on the top half of the screen, it shows the return loss. I'm, I plug this right into a, 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 an antenna cable and put an antenna at the other end. So there's a return loss. There's no antenna on this now, so the display isn't showing anything. The bottom of the thing is distance to fault. And I will see a graph, and if somebody had bent this antenna cable, or if there's a connector in the middle of it, there will be a little bump there. Uh, sometimes a big bump if the table's broken. So I can plug this into the uh, antenna, and it is sending a signal out to the antenna, and it's measuring what's reflecting back. So that's, that's one of the advantages of the field fox is it has that antenna analyzer built into it. Um, the FSH3 has a separate little block that you screw onto the top. It does the same thing, but it doesn't display it in a dual dual graph display. Um, when, relate, when contributing scans to the database, um, I got a lot of scans from some people that, in particular, were done with wireless workbench or were done with a, a scanner like the Firefox or FieldFox. And I, get, I look at the scans and I look at it and it's, you can barely, barely see any TV stations on it. It's like all noise. And I know it's not all noise, uh, 
but the but the, the they didn't have enough reference level on their on their on their scan. So I'm going to recall a setup back up here. Uh, let me try another one here. There, here on this scan right here, this is this is a scan with a reference level of 40, and you see it's it's enough so I can tell where the DTV stations are. If I use a change my reference level, and on this on the spectrum only it's level, I click on level and then set set ref. Oh, I missed I missed level. reference level and here I'm going to go to the reference there. so I'm right now I'm on minus 40 36 34 one. it's not easy to demonstrate but what I'm trying to say is I like to have as much gain on my scan as possible. If you're not seeing the DTV station, the nice little square blocks that come out, you need to have a higher reference level on your spectrum analyzer. And even the inexpensive ones, Explorer, do have adjustments for your reference level and your, your reference gain. Um, so you can look, you want to look to that to have a, 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 a high value. Now there was one venue I went into on uh, Katy Perry, and it was a venue in France, Lyon, France, I think. And I go into the venue and I pull on my spectrum analyzer, and it's it's every 20 megahertz there was a little bump like this. The entire spectrum from 400 to 700, the entire spectrum, every 20 megahertz little bump and I figured there was some kind of weird thing happening outside so I took my uh, TTI and I walked outside it all went away walked back inside all came back so I right away suspected the house video screen and I go to the I go to the tech manager for the show and I said I'm having a lot of problems doing a spectrum scan and I need to have the house video screen turned off. And he turns to the house person and said, I have never had Peter Erskine come to me and say he's got a problem. So turn off your screen. And sure enough, he turned off the screen, it went away. Unfortunately, they wanted to use the screen. So we, we, we turned off the screen, it still was there. We turned off the power supplies, it went away. So we had to use it. So all I did is I treated each little bump in the spectrum as an unusable part of the spectrum and i turned on the chant the yellow blocks at the bottom of ias where each bump was and i just coordinated all mics in between all those bumps for the entire spectrum and it worked fine but this that was probably the worst case of noise from uh from uh, screens that i've ever had um, Steve Wojtek says that when I'm coordinating with IS multiple spaces in a large venue, uh, do you do a different scan for both places? Well, what I usually do is I start out with a scan outdoors, which is a worst case. It's never going to get any worse than that. And I do all my coordination with the scan from outdoors. And then if I'm in a space and it doesn't work, then I do a scan inside and see where the empty spots are and I go there. So that's the answer to that. Matt, Pete, what's that? Yeah, you were talking about settings on the uh, analyzer earlier. You were talking about your reference level. Could you talk a little bit about resolution bandwidth? Um, there's there's two things in there: sweep bandwidth and video bandwidth. And 
maybe I can demonstrate what the difference in that is. Um, so here's that that scan that I was talking about before that I had, and this has a, a resolution bandwidth of 300 kilohertz and a video bandwidth bandwidth also of 300 kilohertz. Now, if I take the uh, sweep bandwidth and set it to audio, audio, auto, auto, which means it picks its own frequency. Now it's on auto and it's one millihertz, megahertz. It flattens the picture out a little bit more and eliminates the detail in the screen. So the resolution bandwidth is basically what it is. It's resolution, how much resolution you can get. If I go to RBW set and set it to be 100 kilohertz, now it's the sweep is very slow, but I see every little peak in the scan. And if I set it, if I set it to 10 megahertz, the sweep is very fast. And there's much less detail. The ramps going up and down to each different frequency are less less visible. So that's resolution. If I go back to my RBW audio and set to um, VBW, right now we're at 300 kilohertz. On the video bandwidth, if I set it to 10 megahertz, At 10 megahertz, I'm seeing a lot more detail on it. It's sort of opposite of resolution bandwidth. Resolution bandwidth is the speed of the scan. Video bandwidth is the detail in the scan. If I go into video bandwidth set and set it to be 100 kilohertz, set 10 megahertz, Well, you know, it's hard to see on this because I'm averaging every scan because it's averaging every scan. So it's it, it, if the first one that comes in is very, very um, uh, smooth and then it averages all out. And the reason I do average scan is I like to have a more, not not so much noise in there. So if you do an average scan, but I usually find that 300 and 300 is my choice resolution and video bandwidth. For, for the TTI. Uh, auto will get you there as well. If I go to auto. Right, because resolution bandwidth would be the window that the analyzer is looking at as it scans. So with a bigger bandwidth, it's it's sort of averaging the number for a bigger, a bigger window as it scans. So it can scan fast. Is, is this speed scan faster, but it's not going. getting the detail. So if, you, if, you're, if your scan is going slow, it's getting every little thing. Right. And if it's going fast, it's sort of zooming over things and not getting them. So here's a here's an, a, a, a VBW of 30 kilohertz, which is which is sort of losing all the detail in the in the noise floor. Not that you need detail in noise floor. Uh, but I just find that that setting it to um, uh, 300 and 300, I end up with this kind of thing. So with that video bandwidth of of uh, uh, low, I was missing auto. I was missing this. I was not getting this this one little TV station right there. So I think that the important thing when you send in a scan is it sort of lets you know what the TV stations are. That's the important thing. Um, uh, I know that other other spectrum, other RF coordinators who are used to using their spectrum analyzers in the lab, as it were, will change their antennas on the spectrum analyzer depending on what they're measuring. Um, I find I, I don't really care what the level is as long as it's I see that I have a TV station. This particular spectrum thing 
is using an, a, a 2.4 gigahertz antenna out on my balcony because inside my apartment it is uh, I don't can't get anything. So you see, I'm looking at at basically 620 megahertz, but even though it's a 2.4 gig Wi-Fi antenna, it gets plenty of RF coming in there. It's just not at the calibrated level. Um, TV channels the FCC have saved as DTV, but appear to not be DTV. Some places, particularly again along the Canadian border, up until recently, still had analog stations running, and you would see them. And the analog station is basically a, a, a bump, and then another little bump, and another little bump. So it really, in reality, we in analog stations, we used to be even stick some wireless mics in those holes there in an analog station. Um, I blocked out 17, 18, 19. Um, that's true, I did. Seven, yeah, right. This pink down here, it's the land mobile. I blocked them out, I blocked them out wrong. However, these, these here, which are 18, 19, 20, are DTV station, so I blocked those out. But these right down here are automatically blocked out, just like 37 is automatically blocked out as a as a uh, verboten space. I can scan in here a little bit. The same with this. This is this down on the left here is uh, VHS, VHF. So there is a couple of DTV stations down there, which I would turn on if I had a RAD system in my coordination. Um, because John Jason said, because it's also calculating intermod products of your mics and not moving them. Um, that was in reference to your when you were taking out whole blocks of. Uh, and looking for new frequencies. Oh well, I couldn't find it. Yeah, when I was trying to do a coordination with all my frequencies in the in the, in the list there, I was only doing one little portion of it, and therefore all the rest was being blocked out from my usage. So if I had, and I said, if I had trouble doing that when I came into a very congested area, I would start from zero with my coordination and just do the transmit first, and then I'd add. The, uh, the the mics on top of that. Um, do I prefer to spread all my frequencies across the entire spectrum every day, or do you prefer to move fewer frequencies per day? I only change the frequencies that I have to. So if I go to, into another venue and I do a recalculate, and the frequencies that some frequencies did not change, it's less time at the receiver than changing all those frequencies. Some occasionally, when in Europe, which has actually very little over the air broadcast, I often would go from one city to the other and not change anything because they would all be in clear spaces. Um, how to get everything done right away? Imagine you are short of time. You have 30 minutes to set up things. 91 in-ear monitors. Oh, nine in-ear monitors and 10 handhelds. Up and go before the door is opening. Um, well, that's not very thing. That's only 20 different frequencies. So you could, assuming you hadn't done any coordination in advance, you could skip the scan and just take the FCC download in IAS and start from there and pick frequencies and immediately look at them on your uh, on your receivers, put them into your receivers, look at them in the receivers because the receivers are actually much finer adjusted to showing interference on their channels and just plug them in, skip the analyzer, just plug them in and keep choosing frequencies until you get them all working. Yeah, Kelly. 
Um, also, maybe throwing out there too, you know, with um, you pointed out AT's new uh, control software, they're out with obviously Sennheiser has theirs and sure has Workbench. Um, one of those scenarios may be set those up, do your scan. Right. If you have a if you have a spectrum manager, obviously you can see everything. But if you have an analyzer, getting that scan at some point, getting in that space that day. Once you have that, plot your solution pretty quickly in one of those. If you're controlling it anyhow and you got your your system set up, it makes a good case for having that organized. You know, one of the the yeah. things I've taken some notes here over the course of your presentation, and I can't seem to avoid coming back to documentation. Right and and having some things prepared already. And when you're talking about speed, even um, uh, you know, with your booklet, how do you making that list of things that I need to have done in order? Walk in, make it a ritual, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you want to grab uh, some more questions that have uh, sparked your interest? Sure. Uh, what what I do it, on tour, typically you'll have uh, two or three days in a row in different cities, and then a day off. Well, the day off is usually, but not always, in your next city. If it's in the next city, I'll do a scan in the hotel to save 10 minutes when I get to the site. Because a scan in the hotel is, is it couldn't be any worse than the venue if it's long as it's close. Uh, it saves a little time. And then I said, I did a, if I do a pre coordination for every city I'm going to, I put that IAS file in folders for each city which doesn't mean i'll always use it but if i if i had a problem with it and i wanted to start with a coordination that was reasonably okay for a city i was going into i could always fall back to that coordination um john safrick says is there any drawback to combining uh, combining combiners well first of all you can't don't ever use, never, don't ever combine a combiner. Um, what I did on Katy Perry's show is I had two ear transmitters for her into a combiner, a sure, a sure combiner. Then I had four ear, com ear combiners for stage left performers, to, and I had four ear combiners for the stage right performers. So basically, I didn't put them all in one place. Um, I, I got found I got better coverage on the stage by putting out multiple combined signals, particularly if I was able to to uh, to. Now, in this particular case, I put all three Sennheiser uh, uh, helical antennas um, on stage left, all right together, bum bum bum, right next to each other. And it seems illogical, but they work great. It work, uh, the, the, the advantage to that is I, there was a fly, a foy, a, a flying rig uh, winch off stage right. It was 12 feet tall. So I put my antennas on top of the flying rig and I permanently installed mic stands there. And it traveled that way into the truck. And I would just run out there, throw out my antennas and, and, and go. And only in one venue where they were shooting a video of the, of the concert and the, the video company came in, in with a rack of high power RF radios with eight giant Yagis on it that they put on stage right. I had to then extend the stage right in your monitor antenna over to stage right to give them a better chance of it working. Um, so I don't, I would never combine into a combiner for in air monitors. It just doesn't give you anything. Now, that being said, the Sure combiner has a little passive combiner on the front of it. So you can take eight channels of a Sure combiner and eight channels of a Sure combiner and passively combine. The two outputs into one output that's not terrible um the uh, uh what i have done with mics is i for really big shows i would take an antenna from stage right stage left put it into a combiner and then feed that combiner through channel filters so i'd run one into 
uh, combiner that gives me my mics that are all in in a particular range of channels and another in another range of channels another so basically i was filtering the signal from the first combiner and putting it in the second combiner so in a mic combiner i think it's it, it's permissible to do two levels but i would never do two levels of a of a of a powered in-ear monitor one right after the other um it just messes thing up messes everything yeah, you, up you don't want to amplify a sig an amplified right. signal that's already been combined right right uh lloyd ballister said do i ever inter 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 encounter intermod stuff from walkie talkies and do i consider them in the calculations i get interference i see it but I don't include them in the walkie-talkies. They're, it, it, it's a, they're really too far away. And the main problem I have with walkie-talkies, particularly if I'm using, if I'm doing a show where I need to use powered antennas, like the Shure amplified antenna, I have to put an antenna 200 feet away uh, using a powered antenna on an indoor show. Somebody will walk near that antenna and just basically blow it into overload, and I'll just see all that chan all the channels on the on the receivers pop up uh, because somebody near walkie-talkie is using it. Now, generally, walkie-talkies are not used during the show by a touring show. They're used for loading. Um, on on the Katy Perry show, uh, they had. Uh, uh, four or five elevators and and a fly flying program to fly Katie around the, the stadium and one to fly people back and forth across the middle of the stage. So a big automation department. So we had all those people on BTRs. Uh, generally, audio people on a tour have no intercom. They, they, have, a, they have sort of a, a maybe a clear comm between their bases, but they don't, they mostly talk between themselves over the, over the, uh, the, the crew talkback monitor, because every performer on the stage has a push button and a mic and they can talk into it. And that's all mixed into the crew in-ear monitor. So they can hear uh, what's happening. So maybe a performer on the stage is, you know, says the usual, you know, can I get more, more uh, a cowbell in my monitor? And they'll mix it in. Um, do I monitor using an analog freaks during the show? Yes, I uh, typically uh, there are more automated ways of doing it, and and uh, Steve Caldwell is coming to our uh, uh, show, uh, our, our Faraday cage show of analyzers, and he uses some equipment. What's the name of it, Mac? It's is that the, uh, is that the signal hound? Yeah, Signal Hound. He's already put all his frequencies in it, so it scans the whole spectrum. He sees all his live frequencies move by, and if any new frequencies pop up, it shows him right away. Well, what I typically will do with my field fox is, particularly right before the CEO walks on the stage, I'll look at their mic. I'll check their frequency to make sure it's okay. Um, uh, on some shows, um, we're using Axiom Digital, uh, which have remote control mics, ABX. Uh, and you can change the frequency just by clicking on a frequency and it goes. And last year, last four years ago, when we did the debates, uh, the, 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 uh, the, we were using Axiom Digital. And I would fairly often, without even worrying about it, I'd see a little tiny bump show up next to a, a frequency I was using. I would just pick another frequency. It was as easy as that, rather than trying to worry about it. Um, the um, and I'm sure that will come up more in the short presentation on wireless workbench. Oh, that comes definitely. Later. It, it's great because the, you know, the wireless probably. workbench manages all that stuff, including the uh, the, uh, the the all the spare frequencies. Um, so Brad Galvin, um, yeah, I have uh, macros I use in 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 uh, Excel that automatically convert from all the different versions of scanning from my TTI, my Field Fox, from from a Sure Wireless Workbench, and converts it into a standard shape that 
it is readable by everybody and gets rid of all the extra jump junk. Um, the rscans.com uh, database has that built into their database, which is really good. It's nice. I haven't gone that far. I figure if I'm doing a free list of frequency scans, the people using it have to uh, fix it themselves. Uh, Cause it's a lot of work doing that. It's a, typically it'll take me two or three minutes per frequency per city to enter that stuff in the database. So I, and I've gotten a lot of, a lot of different channels now. I forget how many I have in there, but, but, uh, uh 1600, uh, frequencies, only 42 of which are recent. I think, uh, not because of the COVID virus, but just because strangely enough, a lot of frequency coordinators go on to bigger and better jobs like mixing the show. So I have to recruit people who want to do scans. If you're listening to this and you want to do scans, call me, do scans. And if you can do good scans and send them to me, I pay $10 a, $10 a city for those scans. So you can make up a, a good bit of money while on tour. Um, here's right, uh, 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 let me show you on this other screen right here. Um, Ryan Stotts has a, a method of converting CSV files from Roden Schwartz to professional wireless. Here's uh, uh, Diego Nunez has the CSV files from Explorer. His, his thing may have a bad link on it. It was a, a link in Sure users form. I have to find a new one for that. Here's one automation script for RF Explorer. Here's a story about uh, participating in the scan collection and getting paid for it. Now, this this is actually an interesting thing right here. This little chart I have here. This is the chart I put on my TTI, and it it gives me the start frequency, the end frequency, the bandwidth, and the center frequency, and a name for the channel. So these are all the different channels I I I uh, I scan, and I I put it on the on the uh, front of my my box. But it's also set up in all of the uh, scans inside. Now I found it's a little problem problematic in sharing those setup files. Here's the setup file folder from my current uh, PSA 3605, and a lot of people have had issues in trying to get it in other PSA models. So I'm not sure it will work uh, really, really well. In my in my uh, spectrum scans, I also Here's a, a, from Oslo, Norway, the re, arena there. In my scans, I always include with my scan um, photos of that city. Because I, for the life of me, can't remember a venue when I go to the next venue. And I love to be able to look back at photos and say, oh yeah, that was the stage that had the really great uh, uh, state uh, load-in bays and that kind of stuff. So nobody else seems to share those pictures of the database, the way of the, uh, venues the way I do, but I, uh, I like it. There are a couple of websites that do have pictures of your venues. You're sharing the Google sheet right now. That's what I'm, uh, oh, I was looking at the, at the, at the, at the questions here. Um, uh, when I plan my tr TX frequencies like IEM and comms, what is my rationale of spreading up frequencies to get more channel to channel? And packing together to reduce the spectral bandwidth of IEM. Uh, I don't. I just let gas do it all. It's the same thing. Point point three spacing. Um, <clears throat> once I get the frequencies all down there and they sort of look good in my spectrum analyzer, I put them into the receivers with all the antennas out on the stage where they're going to be, and I turn on. I take all the transmitters, and I put them across the front of the stage or put them on a table out there, turn them all on. So I've got signal on every single one everywhere. And I've got good reception. It works. They all sound great. You're talking to them. They sound great. But one at a time, I will go uh, have somebody watch the spectrum analyzer or I'll do it and turn off each transmitter. And I'll see the carrier go away. And what I want to see is a nice, plain, clear signal underneath it. If I don't see it, one of two things that happens, there's some other little station that's popped up or an inner mod and or reflection has gone there. So I will, if I don't have a totally clear space, 
I will immediately select a new frequency, put it in the receiver, they'll put it in the transmitter, try it again. And unfortunately, to make this war game work, I have to go back to the beginning and start scanning all of them again, because every time I change a frequency, it could make it show up anywhere. So I'll look at all the frequencies. Then I'll turn them all off and I'll look at the receivers in the rack. And I don't want to see any LEDs lit there, maybe one or two on a channel. But if it's totally clear, I'm happy with it. If it's not, if I've got two or three LEDs on there, I'll immediately look at it on the spectrum analyzer. And it, typically it will be just a high noise floor. And I'll pick a frequency that's on the other end of that device's possible spectrum to change it to. And then eventually I'll get it down so I have no lights on there. Um, oh, Henry brings up a point. If you're not using eight transmitters on your eight channel combiner, start by putting them on one, three, five, seven. So they're on odd, odd ports. So they're non-adjacent because the separation of the signal going from one to the other is higher between, in other words, basically in, internally it has a two-way combiner, two-way combiner, two-way combiner, two-way combiner. And if you use the odd or even settings, you have a, a few more dB of isolation between the inputs. Uh, I, can I an, export IAS frequencies to wireless workbench? No. So, this is something I've always asked them for, and I totally understand why they don't want to do that because then I would, they would be pr promoting using IAS with their workbench. So typically, what I'll do is I will take um, this this printout of uh, uh, the way I'm doing that is this, let me show you here. Let me close this tab here. Close this. Close. 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 Close all tab. So here in print up top. There's an option called master list report. And normal report separates everything by the equipment. So here's a BTR, the frequencies, here's the, the mics down there. So it sets, puts them in two columns. Master list report puts them all in one line sorted by frequency. So sometimes I'll just print out this, and that's the, the list I'll walk around to look at in, at ENG people. And yeah, this we're, not, we're not seeing that, Pete. We're still seeing the. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have to show the entire page. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I have to show your oh, desktop. So here, let me go back here and show the first one before. So if I'm on normal report, it combines it into groups by each different uh, name of the zone. And if I use print master list report, it then gives me a diagram that's just all in frequency order. It even tells me how much space is in between each. It tells me what zone it's in, what my assignment is, and what TV channel's on. So sometimes I'll just print this sheet out and just walk around and find the ENG crews and manually figure out where they're going to fit in the hole and write and enter them in IAS uh, to start uh, later on. Um, so when I go, when I take IS frequencies from that list, I'll just go into the inventory tab on wireless workbench and manually enter the frequencies. It takes a little bit of time, but it goes pretty fast. I'm going to start workbench right now and show it to you. So if I go to the inventory tab, and I have some some microphones in here. I'm going to add new device, and I'm going to put in a, a, a sure that that sure right there. I'm going to add uh, a bunch of channels. So now I have my my workbench file. And uh, usually what I do is if I've got all the receivers all set up and all the in-ear monitors all set up, I'll just plug Workbench into them. And assuming my IP is set all right now, but they will populate 
with all the channels that are in there and with the titles that are in there. So if I want to do, then I can just go through this list right here and on the frequencies right here, find best, I would just double click and put in uh, 600.250, enter. Well, I have to go find a band, but I'll just, I'll just double click and I will put in the frequencies here and just go down the list. And if it's an, if it's an uh, ADX system, those frequencies will instantly populate to the transmitters. If they're not, I then just have to sync all of the transmitters to the, um, train, to the uh, receivers. So it's sort of a manual thing. I wish there was a way to export even a CSV file and import it in. Um, I do tend to use Workbench when I have a lot of sure equipment because it's easier to change the frequencies on the receiver. I just go here, double click, enter a new frequency, comes up on the receiver. Um, I still will use, use the uh, 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 IAS to do the calculation because it's a little bit easier. And uh, the next show I'm doing as a lunch is basically just IAS versus workbench uh, one i'm going to coordinate a show with both at the same time so i don't have to spend much time to talk about it here um uh, rf attenuation on the psm 1000 uh sometimes i turn down the rf output uh, uh from the transmitter yeah i i don't i start out with whatever the default is and if i if I'm in a small room, I'll look at it, maybe make it smaller, because RF is uh, insidious. It gets everywhere. It gets into cracks behind the wall, everywhere. And the more RF you have, the worse it is. So you want to uh, have have a, as little RF as you can get away with it. Um, IAS, IAS does not coordinate around uh, any peak that is not marked as a DTV station. So if it's marked as a yellow DTV station, like on this drawing here, IAS is going to skip this block here. It's going to try to put something right on the edge of it. Because if you look at a DTV station, it sort of goes like this. If you look at the scan of it, has, it gets very low right at the edges. But it's not going to put it in the middle. There is no way to uh, uh, have IAS determine it. Now, there is a way to automatically avoid frequencies that you want to avoid. So when I went to the Mohegan Sun uh, with, with Katy Perry, they, they, they bring to you very nicely, they bring to you a PDF of all the frequencies in use at the Mohegan Sun that you have to stay away from. And in their um, chart, they also include all the live TV stations. So you can use from one chart, you can see what's happening there, it's great. But what I asked them to do is give me a, a, an Excel version of that. And you can take an Excel version, and I'll do that when we go in, in the next time when we're doing uh, IAS and Workbench. You can take an Excel version and put it into both programs, the CSV file, put the frequencies in there, and in another zone and it will automatically avoid and space away from those frequencies you're being asked to stay away from so that's that's a really important thing to do otherwise you if you have a there there were like 600 frequencies we had to stay away from um let me look at my thing John Sulik says, is there any advantage to grouping your transmit frequencies together in a few TV channels to keep the IMD products from affecting a broad range of other usable? Well, first of all, I would put my transmit frequencies in their own area. It, it, it's band planning. I would put all of the all of the same type of frequencies in their same area, spaced a little way from, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take in-ear monitors and put microphones in the same band like this because I'm just asking for trouble. The in-ear monitors, particularly if they get overloaded, if the transmitters get overdriven, are going to splatter all over the place. And it's one thing to splatter onto another, another in-ear monitor channel, 
but even worse, to splatter into a mic. So I keep them in separate places. Um, can you bring gear from the U.S. to other countries? There are. It it depends. I did all of. I did the two or three tours I did in Europe with the same equipment I had in the U.S. Um, the bands all work in the same place. They're all type approved to work in both places. Um, we did have an, uh, 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 an unfortunate incident in uh, Berlin where we came to Berlin and the walkie talkies were rented uh, by production and I was not involved with them. And I should have been, but I wasn't. And we get there and we start doing our load in and within 30 minutes, we had the, the venue swarming with German frequency police, as it were. And apparently the audio channel of the walkie talkies was on the same downlink frequency of the fire department in Berlin. So they knew it was audio because we were talking about audio. And what had happened was the, the, the radio rental company had created profiles for each different city, but hadn't told production about it. Once we figured that out, we then, I made it my point to tell production, okay, at the end of every show, tell everybody when we get to uh, Switzerland, we're gonna be on this profile on your radios and change your radios. But the problem with interfering with Berlin, we come back to Berlin for a second show and they made us approve every single frequency in the show. And, uh, Ob objected to some of them if they were even on a weak, weak TV station. No, it can't be on a TV station. So as long as you play nice and don't interfere with everybody uh, and, and do the right thing, for the most part, uh, you can use them anywhere. Now, some places like uh, England like you to pre, pre like you to apply in advance to get a license for them. Um, we, we, for, the, for the European tours, we had a terrific guy from France, and his name will come to me in a minute, who did all our pre-coordination and pre-licensing for all the cities in Europe. And, um, oh, darn it. If anybody remembers, let me know. I'll come to you in a minute. But basically, there are people in Europe who will do this licensing for you. And there is some charge in some cities. And again, you just pass that on to production. That's their cost of doing show to get the license. So we'd have to pay a certain amount for X number of frequencies. For the most part, they didn't care where the frequencies were, as long as we weren't interfering with anybody. Um, Noise in acoustic guitars with a Shure Axiom Digital. I have not dealt with this, but I've heard about. It. So I don't know what the issue, what how that can be dealt with. Anybody else? I would, uh, uh, I would suggest on that one. Uh, that's that's kind of an emerging topic. I would reach out to Shure's applications group, as I would any other manufacturer that you're using, and talk to them specifically about the digital. Right. Um, I know um this is a kind of a brave new world we're in now uh so reach out to the manufacturers it's the same note i was going to make about uh your your point about uh using rf in other countries and traveling with equipment um it's the same same kind of principle here uh, my experience has been uh same as yours in the uk everything was licensed so i worked with my local contacts there and they ensured that kind of um uh to make sure that we were uh in compliance uh remember obviously most of the new major manufacturers sure sennheiser at wizzy all these folks they're adhering to multiple uh countries so eu united states um most of these uh manufacturers do work to to find compliance there you have to remember that uh what's tunable in the us isn't necessarily tunable anywhere else in the same way, right? So even if you took a product that that was technically um, 
uh, compliant from a what we would consider our FCC spurious emissions or noise things like that um, you do have to be very mindful that again not all these free uh, the spectrum uh, translates equally and if you're operating outside of an area um, that is uh, legal in these countries uh, there can be uh, as Pete uh, experienced there are uh, you know mild slap on the hand to um, a a formal uh, uh, issue. So all that to say, reach out to um, uh, obviously the production company that's hosting you uh, in that country. Reach out to the manufacturers. I've had great luck with every manufacturer I've ever talked to in helping to understand. Uh, they, they want you to have a great experience with their equipment no matter where the world it is. So collaborate, reach out to us. We're always happy to share. Uh, I'm I'm happy to share what didn't work for me uh, equally as fast as what did work. Um, uh, you have some more questions there, Peter? Mac, I see you, you have a Yeah, I just was, I came back just uh, on that uh, interference from acoustic guitars on uh, Axiom Digital. Uh, there's also certain, uh, like, you can't really use Crown, uh, the old Crown. The 311. 311 on them. Uh, you may find some relief by putting a ferrite bead on the mic cable before the transmitter. People have had success with that issue. Yeah. Putting a ferrite bead on. Um, on all the shows I was on, we did have Axiom Digital on for the voice, but that we used non-digital for all the guitars. Understood. We didn't have that issue, not because of that but that's just the way they had the equipment already. Sure. Um, uh, question, do you use your scanner with the same antennas that are gonna be used during the show, like the microphone antennas? No, I just use a whip. I, I, my, I, my favorite is just this one whip right here. It extends it to about 24 inches or so. Um, again, it's not tuned necessarily to the band you're using, so it's I'm not getting spectrum scans that are calibrated but unless i'm so do you use it fully extended pete or do you do you do you have some preset lengths well um TV, how do you normally tv is about that that bandwidth it's okay. about remember old T so, T rabbit ears in the, in mm -hmm. the VHF band that's what they were about like this uhf is more like more like this but like i said when I'm using the 2.4 gig antenna out on my balcony for these pictures, um, any antenna will receive RF. They all receive RF all the time. Mm -hmm. It just won't be calibrated. Yeah, so I'm I'm with you there. I kind of do the same thing with the Wilson. Yeah. I just you know leave it fully extended. That yeah. way, if I'm looking VHF, you know I'm uh, kind of moving that center down. I get that, but that's a, that's a trade-off. And for what I'm doing with it, yeah, it's good enough. There's a lot of uh, uh, engineer type uh, spectrum uh, coordinators, RF coordinators, who do use a separate antenna for each band they're using. Sure. Because they're, uh, they're technically correct. They, they expect they expect to see a or an antenna matrix switch measure. on their analyzer to look at all their antennas individually. There's yeah. that too. There's that too. That's um, a great solution. Yeah. Um, what does the pro version of IAS do that the basic cannot we're gonna to have to wait until we get a pws to talk about ias because i've never used the basic version so i don't know what it even what it does maybe it just does less frequencies um you think that's Mark, a good segue hours into yeah. our uh, one hour session here Say that. <laughs> is this a good segue maybe to talk about what's coming ahead because um, just looking through some of the questions. Things that, there, there was one I yeah, absolutely. Know, what model of Field Fox do you own? This is the Field Fox um, N9912. That's. Uh, and also, one person asks How much of an impact will 75 ohm BNC barrels have on RF signal? It depends on how bad your OCD is. Basically, it doesn't make any difference, I think. So you can you can use them anywhere. However, I've also done shows with 
75 ohm video cable as my antenna cables and it's been fine what uh, oh yeah oh yeah oh my god hey in reality 75 ohms is closer to the impedance of the receiver input than a 50 ohm cable so it actually works. it's very important on transmit <laughs> antennas to use the 50 ohm cable it's less important on receive antennas yeah because the the impedance of the system changes by frequency anyway so across the entire spectrum the antenna is receiving it's not going to be within the the tuning anyway it the transmit antennas really need to be 50 ohm receive antennas should be 50 ohm but you can get away with 75 ohm so i i think uh there's a quite a lot of questions we weren't able to answer uh so i'm gonna do it the old-fashioned way and type my answers into the question list and that will be posted with the video of this show so if you want to uh, if your in, if your question wasn't answered uh the 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 uh the gospel truth will be on there by the time it gets posted so Perfectly. Yeah, so that's so usually about 24 hours at the yep. most, usually by tomorrow morning with, the, let's say, at practicalshowtech.com. You can go to the archive page and uh, you can look uh, look for this video, the links that uh, Pete's talking about. Obviously, bestaudio.com is where all of Pete's um, paperwork uh, that he's been referring to, his, uh, his worksheets, the Excel sheet, um, all that's available, bestaudio.com. Keep watching our site, practicalshowtech.com, because uh, that's where we keep the next uh, series of uh, webinars coming up. I, uh, I, I wanna just do a couple quick highlights that I, I wrote down from your notes. I thought the coolest thing you talked about was putting the ENG phone number in as the ID for the frequency. <laughs> Goes back to documentation, right? Why, if you're yeah. already working in the, the program, use it. Right, yeah, and yeah. that that I, I identifies each person. Per, it would work for breakout rooms. It'll work really for anything you're doing, because as long as everybody who looks at that report knows that that is a phone number, then it's relevant to all of us on the team, right? And so give them my phone number. In fact, when they when they come in and they ask me for a frequency, even if they're standing right next to me, I text them the frequency I'm giving them. Then they have me on their phone. I have them on their phone, on my phone, and they can text back, "Can I get another frequency?" And I can do it just like that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of great tools there. Um, I also walked away with the RF coordinator role is always necessary. Okay, I mean that's a that is I can't emphasize that enough. On every show, someone is the RF coordinator. Now, is that a separate position? As we talked about, not always going to be the case. Budget may not allow, size of show may not allow, but someone on that show, like we talked about at the beginning, yep. is going to be managing those frequencies. So yep. if you recognize that, there is opportunity there. You know, obviously we see the RF coordinator and the comms manager get bundled together. I think that that makes a lot of sense personally. Anything that, yep. that is RF related, it, it makes sense to put those two together. So if you have a person that is in charge of comms, RF coordination is a good one. When you start getting above a certain size, obviously that becomes a challenge. You know, if you're doing 12 to 20 wireless mics and you're using a deck based comm system, um, you're probably busier programming the comm system than pitching frequencies, right? Um, RF coordinator and monitors, the, the engineer, that's a good combination. I would say though, great opportunity folks, if you're out on tour, if you're working in those kind of situations, Find a second person, whether that's your system engineer, whether that's um, someone else. Yes, it kind of breaks the protocol that maybe that we've grown up thinking about, but find a second person. God forbid you don't wake up that next morning. God forbid you're sick with COVID. Whatever it is, someone else needs to be able to at least at minimum get that system up and running, right? So always have a second person that has access to that information. So usually I share it with, uh, a twos on the show, which mm -hmm. they may not be be specifically RF coordinators. On the other hand, they do handle all the mics. They know where all the mics are. They know where the wireless are, and they usually end up dealing with the wireless. Um, right, and they're in touch so, with the talent. Exactly. Right. Exactly. They're the ones that are going to know instantly when the talent's having an issue. 
All right. We're having, so we're not only are we ahead. having an uh, an RF a Faraday cage match with RF people, but we're going to have not a cage match, but a, 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 a section with only audio A2s. April telling 7. All the stories, telling all the stories yeah. of uh, working on shows and dealing with uh, uh, performers that don't want to have a mic put on them. There you go. Lunch with A2s. That's going to be April 7, Tuesday, April 7, in that lunch spot. Um, other RF topics, April 3rd, this Friday, wireless workbench. We're going to have two folks on from Sure talking through functionality, um, helping to, to, to dig a little deeper for folks. So come back for that. If you were on this one, that's one that apply to you. Um, it's going to be focused heavily on, on that control. A lot of the Axiant Digital thing we talked about and pitching frequencies out to the system. Uh, another RF topic, April 6th, PWS. This is with Gary Trenda. We're going to be talking RF over fiber. We're going to be talking multi-antenna systems. We'll obviously touch on IES, but that honestly is really more about RF over fiber and, and antenna systems, that alone. Then the 13th is a deep dive into a IES with Gary again, and that is an all IES day. So lots of RF stuff coming up. Uh, keep those uh, questions coming in. You have our emails. Um, go to practicalshowtech.com. Look at the contact. You'll Everybody's there. We got time. Stay in touch. We'll help point you in the right direction to people that we know. And uh, thanks for joining us for lunch. And uh, now I'm going to go get some lunch. So long, <laughs> there we go. So long, Max. Stay, stay safe, everybody. All right. Bye.